Hey, hey man, how, how you, you doing? doing? <laughs> hey, very good. Very good. Happy birthday, thank brother. Thank you, thank you. It is my birthday. I'm awesome. 40 years old. Amazing. Four zero. Amazing. Four zero. I don't see any gray hair, so uh, I don't know about that. You sure? Side. Yeah, no, I, I'm sure, I'm sure. Nice, man. That's uh, yeah. a great number. It is. It is great. I like it. You know. Now, it just so happens it that is. today is also Channel 9's birthday. Yes. We turned nine. Nine. Lots of videos. So rock and roll to all the Niners out there and everybody yeah. that produces content, everybody that's been on camera, you know who you are. Yeah. Amazing stuff. It we love great. you. Yeah. And uh, Goldness made a wonderful video people should watch. Nine minutes of nine. Beautiful <laughs> stuff. Takes you through the history. Beautiful. So and I want to ask a question because okay. 40, 9, and 20. Smart people out there should figure out what's the pattern. Okay. Right, come back to us with information about what the pattern is. Okay. But in terms of visual C++, why did you call it visual C++? It's Visual C++ 20th birthday. Yes. And we call it Visual C++ because uh, you know, I asked the people that were there for Visual C++ 1.0. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was Visual Basic, and they wanted to brand C++, this new C++ in a certain way. And mm -hmm. basically, they had Visual. And they kind of create a Visual Studio brand with that. That was Interesting. a pretty cool story, right? So Visual but C++ also, plus is sort of like the, the, the beginning of yeah, the yeah, advent the, of exactly. Visual Studio. Yeah, yeah. And then we change, we move to Visual Studio overall mm -hmm. after Visual C++ plus plus six and that's a lot of story behind that. I met a lot of people cool. when we got together for this birthday for Visual C++. Right on. Well, happy birthday fun. to everybody out there involved with Visual C++. Yes, that's and for true. C++ programmers, yeah. regardless of whether or not you use Visual C++, rock and roll yes. to you. Huge kudos to you guys. You make a wonderful product. Thanks, thanks. Now, I caught up with Jan Gray. Yeah. Enrico yeah, Mariani. Enrico Mariani, yes. Those guys were sort of on the original team. They were there, yes. you know, to do the first one. Totally. The first Visual C++. And they tell us about some fun. of the big problems they had, um, you know, implementing Visual C++ uh -huh. 1.0. And you know what? I think folks are going to learn stuff they've never, never heard before. Maybe, yeah. It's, Let's it's see if it's cool true. Stuff. Yeah. All right, yeah. man. All right. So we are here. This is the 20th anniversary of Visual C++. We're with at least one familiar face, Rico Mariani. Hi. Nice to see you again, man. Nice to see you. I didn't again. even know you were on the C++ team back then. Yeah, I, I had two stints in DevDiv. I was in DevDiv for, before it was called DevDiv, for seven years. Okay. And then I worked in MSN for about seven years. And then I came back and worked again in DevDiv for about seven years. I do everything in multiples of seven. <laughs> so as soon as the number of years I've been here is, con is congruent to zero mod seven, then I have to change divisions. Excellent. And uh, we're here with Jan Gray as well. Hi. Uh, and you organize this event, right? I mean, this yeah. is an event. Yeah. Tell us about it. What's going on? Okay, so um, I guess 21 years ago we shipped C7, and for the going native thing last year, I know that we, well. Uh, we said, you know, we should do something to recognize C7 because that was the first C++ product from Microsoft. From Microsoft, yeah. Um, and then I was thinking we should have a reunion because we had a fantastic team and people were great and it was a wonderful experience and one of the highlights of my like The career. current people are great too, let's be clear. Oh sure, <laughs> I just don't know that. <laughs> no, that's right. And, um, <laughs> no, no, the current team, they're a bunch of losers. But I'm thinking, you know, should we celebrate C7 as the focus of the reunion or BC++ 1.0? It was clear the Visual C++ 1.0 was the turning point, you know. So yeah. we've been looking back at um, you know, the, the product reviews and the ads and so forth around 92, 93. And if you think about it, just before C7 <coughs> shipped, Borland had already shipped three versions of C++. Yeah. There were uh, many other excellent yep. uh, rival C++ products. Yep. Mm -hmm. And we were still trying to get C7 out. Yep. And so you, you've, been lapped, you've been lapped twice. Yep. And, <laughs> yeah. um, That's what it felt like. Right? I mean, C7 had some <laughs> unique strengths. It had a better optimizing compiler and various other things, and a hell of a lot of documentation. Excellent documentation. But uh, it, 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 it didn't take the world by storm. Borland had the momentum, I think it's fair to Absolutely. say. Absolutely. Yeah. We definitely felt like, well, at least we're on the field now. But yeah. Really, that's how we felt. Like, yeah. okay, we're in the game, um, and now we get to play. Um, and that's, you but, know. But then between what was really a long slog to get C7 done, in, and it shipped in April of 92, right? That sounds right. And then, but, and then by February of 93, we had done this Visual C++ 1.0 product. Yep. And it was a turning point. You know, it might be that we'd be at the Borland Development Tools Company or whatever if that hadn't, uh, hmm. hadn't gone so well. Yep. 
and we thought I, it was make or break for for languages. Yeah, at the time. I I remember the the morale was kind of like you know we're behind we're really behind. And, it was and, much worse than that. Yeah, sure, I know. I was like <laughs> we're screwed. Now we're doomed. Yeah. So um, one question I have for yeah. you since you were here, yeah, you know, C plus plus is a tool mm -hmm. that we use. Um, who at Microsoft was really excited about C++ back then? It wasn't everyone writing in C? There were some holdouts. The kernel guys were saying, you know, we can't afford the yeah. abstraction. We can't afford the there, overhead there yeah. of, of all this it's virtual same, function. Uh, but that's what they said when they switched from MASM three years yeah, before, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, Microsoft has gone through these kind of renaissances more than once, right? Sure. Where, yeah. You know, like everything was written in assembly, and like, oh, we can't afford this C compiler thing. Yeah, look at the crazy. cost invention. Like, well, the, of course, we, we can't afford to not, you know, pushing all those registers <laughs> on the object. Yeah. And um, that's, that was the mentality. But then, you know, we made it through that, and we figured out how to use those tools. And then people started adopting C++, and it was a disaster. And because they didn't know what to do, uh, they were using that's all the these expensive ASX things. Story, right? Yeah. So, um, but I would say amongst the applications people, there was more interest in going up and having higher abstraction levels. And I, so I think so too. Uh, yeah. But also, I think everyone was afraid of, can we afford it, and what's yeah. it going to look like? And you remember they had to build works to run on like 128k PC at the time. We, we you know, started you couldn't say, yeah. oh, you're going to add 5k to your total. But that's five percent of my budget. Yeah. You know. Yeah. We started in Apps Tools, both of us. Yep. Okay. And back then, one of Apps. One of Microsoft Applications Division's competitive advantages was that they had a P-code C compiler. Yep. So they could get a factor of two code compression versus people that were generating native code. Yep. And also portability and better yep. tools and so on. Yeah, they got some good, they got some good perks from that compiler. But to kind of come back to VC1, um, there was actually this, do you remember this kind of old time revival meeting? We went to this one all hands meeting. Yep. And it started with, are, are we going to you know, give up the franchise here? And by the time, and there was something magical about this one meeting, yep. this one day at Microsoft. And me and Jim really turned it around. Uh, Denise Gilbert and, uh, and Jim McCarthy. Denise Gilbert? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. There it yeah. is. We did the prop. That's the full site. So, this, is, this is the um, a few pounds. This is the VC1 box, which if you remember the C7 box at, at uh, going... Yeah, it was 50% like, yeah, yeah. bigger at least. Yeah. Um, so it was like 50 pounds or something. It's, it's yeah, just under 50. It's ridiculous. And this was a mere 35 or right. something. <laughs> and um, this, so, this is the last time we ever shipped full books, right? Well, did did you see 5 go to CD? CD? Yeah. By then, yep, we yeah. were already on CD. There was a tree saver edition of this. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I bought. I don't have this. I have the. Yeah, but it looks better on your That's shelf. That's what we called it—the Tree yeah. Saver Edition. It was, kind of, yeah. It does. Even, it, it does make a. a even that was an interesting say. story. You know, yeah. we had to help the developer community get CD-ROM. Yes. Right. So okay. a lot of people didn't have the one. box is shipped with coupons. They had a coupon. Right. You know, send this off. Get a SCSI <laughs> get a, yeah. get a SCSI uh, interface and a yep. Shimon yep. CD-ROM or something. Mm -hmm. yeah, great. Those one point five X drives. Um, with the, and with the caddy, remember the CD caddy that you had to put in it? But this is also the 20th anniversary of MSDN. Yep. Right? So there was some, there was some beta testing of that stuff. And of course, there's Microsoft yep. Systems Journal or whatever it was. Yep, MSU. Yep. But it was really at that point that we started shipping. When you had the CD ROMs, that's when it got practical to bundle all this stuff. You could search all the reference material all at once. Right. Just a little query. <laughs> it was like using Bookshelf only for your docs. It was like crazy good. Yeah. Crazy good, and I forget that. Um, what was the guy's name? Um, uh, forgive me, Dennis something. Dennis, I want to say Dennis Adler. Sounds familiar. Um, oh shoot, uh, maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, forgive me. I don't remember the name for sure. But um, we were baby testing it while this was all going on, and yeah. you know, getting uh, drops of virtual CDs in, on Corknet, and they were like ridiculously big, like yeah. 640 meg of Are data. You bad? We're like 640 <laughs> meg of data. Are you putting that? The whole source enlistment was, you know, way less than that. Our total server space was, you know, I don't even, I don't, I don't want to hazard a guess, but it was way less than a gig. Yeah. You know, maybe a couple hundred meg. Mm -hmm. uh, but to finish the VC1 story, yep. some, there's some magic that happened. And it was, I mean, there were several nice things that came together. Although we had many elegant IDE architectures over the years, we ended up going with something that we had that was actually working and right. shipping, which was the Quick C for, Quick Windows, C for Windows IDE, yep. right? Yep. And then MFC was in version 2 at that point, yep. and it was great. Yep. 
and even greater was the MFC stuff they did for OA2 support, ODBC yep. support that came out. Came right after. Five, yep. right? Whatever. Yep. Bam, bam, right after, yep. Um, the compiler was more mature. We started doing lots of cool perf work to make that go faster. Yeah, we had the performing gorillas. Do you remember the performing yeah, yeah, yeah. gorillas? When gorillas... They wanted to call us the performance gorillas, but we didn't like that because it, it sounded too military. Too, too military. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we called ourselves the performing gorillas. Yes. <laughs> the performance gorillas. Yes. And we had an alias. Our, our, our email alias was, was gorillas like like the, you know, yes. like the ape. Yes. So you could mail gorillas. Yeah, I forgot. That's so we did all this fun stuff. We did, uh, like, we made a bunch of changes in the linker. We integrated... CV pack That's a long linker. story. We did um, <laughs> so, nouns of stuff we did. Um, to, yeah. like, to get the build cycle tighter. Yeah, between C6 and C7, you know, we had the tra very traditional compilation model. Header files. Yep. You compile like, your source files against those headers. Every single object file contains all of your debug information. Yep. Uh, your browser files contain a copy of all, all the cross files 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 contains all the stuff, stuff yep. right? Um, and then what? Oh, we... Um, Orland 2.0 had a kind of pre-compiled headers, yep. which were fantastic. Yep, very helpful. Well, they were not as... as uh, well, anyway, ours, they, were they were, ours were better. Ours actually. were better, actually. And so um, I said, hey, boss, we got to do pre-compiled headers over again. Yep. And boss said, no, schedule risk. No yep. pre-compiled headers. You can't possibly Next do release. Yep. And I said, no, we must do it. So I did it in secret. Uh, like yep. nine evenings, I snuck out. Yep. Hi, we're on camera, so we have to go over there. Yeah, okay. So uh, first, I'm gonna let I'm gonna let my buddy in. Sure, do. He just I'll tell I'll tell the story a little bit for you on. Yeah. While while he lets in, uh, ch uh, I think that's Chuck over there. Um, so he did this experiment where the, the trick to precompile headers is you want to snapshot the heap at a given point in time, right, and then be able to reload it. And to do that, you need to find you need to be able to find every pointer in the heap so that you can fix it up again when you reload it. So you can simulate the hard part of that by saying, okay, what I'll try first is while the compiler is running, I will pick up the heap and move it to over here, <laughs> right? And if I can do that successfully, then in principle, I could have written it to disk in between and then picked it up and loaded it somewhere else and that all would have been fine. Mm -hmm. So over the course of one weekend, no, it was more it like was, a week and a half. No, 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 no. It no. Came well, I have a good a memory. I have a good memory. You were better than mine. Over, yeah. over the course of one weekend, you got the moving experiment working. Yes. And then you came in and said, "Look, I can do this whole move thing. Surely now you yes. must admit the, that the I schedule risk is mitigated, right? Because yeah. I've done the, the tricky part. But right? I think there was a week before that where I was finding all these data structures and you yeah, know, because the, it wasn't designed to be moved, right? It was a ten-year-old code base already, and yeah. the pointers. Yeah. Anyway, so anyway. you can make metadata so, for it all, just like you would with uh, with a managed piece of code, yeah. where you have to know where all the pointers are. Yeah. So, so that was um, skunk works, and that yeah. worked out well. I got a promotion out of that. So that was all right. Nice but, job. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, then we did precompiled types. Yeah, the, think of where, the uh, amount of entropy that isn't in the world because of of the you know the heat right. that hasn't been released from those compile the header files that haven't been compiled. Yeah. So. Um, this, the, the really cool thing about precompiled headers was that we we're going to write an object file <clears throat> that we knew was going to be linked in with the rest. Yep. So we pushed all of the debug types and all of the expensive size stuff into that file. Yep. I think we did the same thing with browser information. We did the same thing with browser information. Right? information. And the, then, the beauty of the way the PCH worked was you knew that the headers you were going to get were exactly the same. Right. Because you couldn't guarantee that. You know, right. The language semantics are like, oh, you uh, might people might include them dependent. in different orders and different lines. The pound of points could be different. But yeah. when you do this PCH trick, you're basically saying, no, for sure, for sure, pretend the headers look exactly like they did over there, yeah. and load that. And never mind if I had them only in approximately the right order. Right. Just use that snapshot. So that let you do all these cool optimizations further downstream. So it wasn't just that we boosted the front end speed, exactly. right? We also boosted CD pack, uh, well, yeah, which we, we still we have talked about CD pack. So we uh, so linking got faster. Yep. Just, we got rid of we got rid of 19 out of 20 copies of everything. Yep. Just what is trivial hack. Yep. Uh, that was C7. Um, BC1. I think we did the pers keeping the types debug types persistently yep. in the PDB in file. the PDBs. Yep. So I'd worked on a number of things in the past that had a program database, and we worked on one yep. at C Sharp. Yeah, C Sharp. Was, sorry, that's another story. C Sharp 88. Maybe that's good for another channel line, another day. C sharp eighty eight. Yeah. yeah, yeah. There was another C sharp before the C sharp that you know of. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The other C sharp was this thing we built in Apps Tools. 
which actually had a compilation model remarkably similar mm -hmm. to the final C sharp. It had this whole pretend everything is streamed and do multiple passes yep. and then do the fix in. It's but it, did it spit out uh, Pico. machine? Oh, so Pico. Pico, so just like the, code. like the apps Pico. Yeah, we yeah. mentioned the apps Pico CS compiler. Yep. We Not had a little entrepreneurial team under Charles Simone and Craig Wittenberg. Yep. Ah. And there's some great, there's Bob Atkins who did Com, yep. uh, and Scott <laughs> Randall who Scott did Randall NFC. Did it, um, really, a, really NFC, a super yeah. team. And uh, that was an incremental C compiler that did away with header files, kept everything in a database, all symbols, yep. types, object code, yep. um, had an incredibly fast browser that Rico did. <laughs> yep. it, programming, uh, productivity, uh, product that Charles Simone, or our internal project mm -hmm. that Charles Simone sponsored. Yep. We had a team of about eight people, half were from Waterloo, as all good things come yeah, from the yeah, University right. of Waterloo. Yeah. And not we, that we're biased or no, anything. No, no, of course not. And right. we built a incremental C compiler, incremental linker, yep. completely incremental everything. Yep. It was everything was stored in this great transacted, object-oriented database yep. of all program artifacts, and you could pop around this object graph and and have a very Fast browsing experience, for example. Right, you could use for source browsing and, or for or for expecting uh, the type graph or whatever you wanted. It was only. And we, because we had these these dependence graphs, it meant that when you edited a source file, what did we do? We had kept, we blocked the source file into these checksum regions, so we could infer what you edited. We would we would skip to the place you edited. We would then have the compiler suck the types it needed out of the database. Yep. Compile one declaration that changed, update the database, propagate the change dependence information, which queued other things that were transitively dependent on the change to be yep. recompiled, which then triggered an incremental link, yep. and your build was done. Yep. Everything about this was great, except the footprint, as is always the case. Yes, right? that's right. So this was 88, 89, and it, it, um, I remember we had one project, which was the source code that eventually became Microsoft Access. That's right. And it needed eight megabytes eight of RAM. Eight megabytes, that's right. And you could only do that with a LIM <laughs> EMS card or whatever. Right, that's right. And telling... A lot, um, it, was too, it was too big, man. Eight yeah, meg. Yeah. Ooh. Telling the applications... No one will ever have that kind of memory. Yeah, if, if every applications developer needed a machine with eight, eight megs meg. of RAM, it was no sale. Right. So we shelved it. Yep. We had all these great ideas, and we pledged that we... We recycled them, and we did. So QuickC2 used the incremental compile technology that we did in C Sharp, yep. and then later it came back in VC4, which maybe we'll talk about. The PDB files that we created, starting with, I think, VC1, yes. were transacted, persistent archives, databases, because you could update pieces of them independently, of derived information, so you didn't have to re-derive it. And so in VC1, one of our performance challenges was CVPack. What the hell is CVPack? Yes. So um, when you would compile a source file, we generate debug information for the debugger to use. What are the symbols and what are their addresses and what All are the, the types. types of those things? Yes. And it was the types that's the big problem. And for every compiland, we would, I don't know how the sun's going, for every compiland, we would generate, say, 50 or 100K, I don't remember how much it was, of type information saying, you know, you got pointer to int and pointer to pointer to int and function of two ints returning a pointer to int and all of struct Windows X, H. all of Windows NH was a huge yeah. thing. And it would generate this object graph, this, this graph of types. And every compiland.obj would have another of these graphs. Yep. Each one would have been created as a separate island of, 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 of identifier numbers, yes. of, of integers. And so CVPAC's job was after linking to collect all of this redundant type information and do graph isomorphism or graph subgraph matching to fold all the duplicate information together. And that took right. minutes. So the link took minutes and then CVPAC took minutes. Right, because it took as long, like we have all these duplicated types that were all the same, right? It was like, it's, it's windows.h, here it is again. Oh, look, here it is again. <laughs> and you have to oh, analyze them all. Oh, one. look, here is another copy. <laughs> yeah. So, and then you'd spit it out and it'd be like, I don't know, 1% the original size. Yeah, it was needed to make the debugger not suck and, at all. And the, right, and of course the debugger, if we had, if we fed all that into the debugger, it would have had a heart attack. So we um, so we would pack it first. And um, and we had done, we had, we had the same problem in the browsing space, but by that time, as soon as you added PCH, um, we could fold a lot of the browser stuff. So the yeah. browser stuff could be processed exactly once with 
with separate uh, stubs for each little compilant. So I only had to process the browsing information once um, to build the, the equivalent uh, browser database. Yeah. But the, the but we the did some of that with the precompiled header with the precompiled type header type as well. Yeah. But it was still a killer. So we the first thing we did with PDB files was put type put the type information there, and nothing was ever duplicated. So because we can load the assignment of types to integers on from the previous compile, we could start from that. Yep. So it was it's called hash consing as a data structure thing. So you would say, do you have a type for pointer to int? Why yes, that's seven. Do you have a type for pointer to seven? Why yes, that's thirteen. Sure. And every compilend would do the same thing. Yep. And we would load the types in as part of compiling, add a few types, and write it back out. Right. And then at so we wrote um, less into the object, right? Which tended to pay even for the cost of doing the lookups. And the link was faster. And then the link didn't have to deduplicate at all because there was no duplicates in the first place. Yeah. So we no, killed no we killed CV pack. Yeah. Uh, so that was VC one. But but we yeah. we did and we didn't. Oh, and we still had to do CV pack because there's always there all these other multiple, objects right, and libraries. Multiple and other objects. Stuff yeah. Like that. Yeah. So we had this funky thing where um, during the during VC one. We still had the CD pack stage, and we had it substantially optimized, right? Yes. And plus the local types for each client. Oh, God, but yeah. we'd write out all the local types, and then the linker would split them out, and then CD pack would read them all right back in, pack them, and write them all back out. Right. So we did this slick trick where instead of exiting the linker and writing the packed information, we'd write the executable part. I'd forgotten this. But yeah, right. we write yeah. the executable part. We then loaded CV we pack. hold our breath, yeah. holding on to the, the debug information we were going to write, <laughs> load CD pack, and then we aim CD pack instead of we change every read file call in CD pack, right? To call these methods that would figure out where the type information that's now in the linker's brain would have gone had it been written to the file. I'd forgotten that. Right? And CD pack still thinks it's seeking, right? That's the, the best part. It still thinks it's seeking. Yeah. So we're doing this in memory file thing. And so then you compress that and write it out directly, and then you drop this on the floor, so the the, the uncompressed types never hit the disk, and you get, you end up with uh, you didn't have to compress as much because you had the PDBs to help you. Um, you have some islands of stuff in OBJs here and there, and you could have more than one PDB because there's no law that says you only right. have one PDB. And, and we handled that too. Right, we handled it too. So you consolidate just that much, and you never write it to disk, and then. Uh, and that ends up being pretty good. Well, that turned the link into a one-minute thing from a five-minute thing or a ten-minute thing. Or yeah. it was. Well, right, because yeah. the, the pack the pack cost was cut. I don't know. We cut ninety-five percent off the yeah. off the pack cost. Yeah. So we were just left with linking is about linking. Yes. Um, and all the a lot of the crapola was gone. So that made a huge difference. And then in BC two and BC four, we turned to more incremental compiler technologies. The idea is most of the time. You've got your, your AFX project, or MFC project, I'm sorry, and you add, it, you add one field, you add one button to a dialogue or something. Yep. Do you really have to recompile everything from zero? No. no. So in BC2, the work was on incremental linking. And uh, the team took the linker and figured out how to persist some of the linker's data structures so that the next time you ran the linker, it could wake up having just linked. And then it looks at which objects are different from the last time. Yep. And it subtracts the uh, binary contributions from those objects yep. that it had previously added in, and then it adds in the new version of those. Right. We used to say twice incremental is still cheap or something. Still yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, but we still had the debug problem. Yep. So in... You have to patch all the line numbers in the debug structure. Right. So we extended and the patch PDB all the browser file. Information. So the PDB file had a section in it. Basically, a PDB is a file system in a file. So we had a little stream in the PDB for each object file, which had its symbols and stuff. So we would rem we'd subtract those and then add in the ones oh, from yeah, the yeah, changed objects. Oh, yeah, you're talking about the types. Yeah, I'm the, talking about symbols now. Oh, and and but the 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 real killer is the line number info, right? Oh, because because yeah, yeah. you just do this wafer thin edit, add a comment, right? And you're yeah. like, oh well, that won't do. We don't have to change it. There's no new types. There's no nothing. They got all the lines moved down one. Jesus, yeah. So when you try to step, right? You know. So there's this fix up table, oh, right? It says, oh, the line numbers. They're not. Well, those aren't the real line numbers. What are you thinking? You have to apply the fix up first. 
then you get the real line number two. So this is Dan's baby, right? He's got the whole thing where Dan Spalding. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and then we did the, and of course everything I just said about the debugger is also true for the source browser info. So I have the right. exact same trick where all the SBRs, that I get a stub SBR that's got, oh, by the way, I were the line numbers. <laughs> I've been, you know, I'm not giving you the whole file, but you right. have to patch these line numbers because right. everything just shifted. So even stuff that we skipped. So we had that, plus we could swap the, we could swap a section of symbols uh, uh, and we swap a section of types and yes. we could regenerate pieces of the publics. And, and changes to the types were just, we only ever just appended types. We only types. appended, right. right. And we just leave the old types. And whatever, they're not hurting. That took it. linking down to tens of seconds or something. Yep. Mm -hmm. That was in VC2. I think that uh, was for, four. A, for an incremental link. I think that was four. No, no, four is next. No, four, in four, we did minimal, minimal rebuild, rebuild and incremental recompilation. Yeah, those things were happening at the same time, I think. Okay. They were both in four. Okay. The, what you're but, talking but this, about. Okay. But, the getting, link but, but by VC2, time. we had killed CV Pack. Yes. And that was a good thing. Rest right. in peace, CV That's Pack. right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I must have really be wrong. with your memory. I could be yes. wrong. But yes. what's remember, going on I, here? I, put, I, put, I know I have to get this all in my head so, when I wrote that history blog, the big long thing. Yes. Yeah. So I, Which I, is, this interview is turning into. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well, that's great. This is gold. This is okay. beautiful Channel 9 material. So, okay. So let's talk VC4. So Wait minimal, a minute, what about VC3? Oh, there was no, no, no VC3. No oh, of course they did this one. No, we skipped three because... There was before, but the planet was. record killed it, and it's <laughs> gone now. No, sorry, that was so a what was, VC, no, what was the no, vision of VC3? No, no, VC, the, the VC you know is VC4, <laughs> is, is, is VC3. three. <laughs> but we renamed it to four because the MFC number was off by one. Oh, of so we wanted to line, because we got sick of saying, VC2 with MFC3, you know, and like having to add one. That worked out really well. Because <laughs> <That worked out, laughs> really, right, after that, we never revved the MFC number again for like 15 years. What a brilliant move that was. So for like two picoseconds, the numbers were yes. aligned. Yes. But we skipped three. Best um, of intentions. So yeah, so three is four. Okay, uh, three four. is four. That is, yeah, four, whatever. So um, that's Olympus. So we were doing uh, minimal rebuild and, and, and uh, and incremental let's, compilation. Let's talk about those. So, um, there's two kinds of edits you do now. If you're doing a small change to your project, you're you're changing a little bit of one source file. Okay. Maybe you're adding one event handler, or you're changing one little bit of a header file. You're adding a button or something. Neither of those require all the files to be uh, rebuilt. And in the case of editing one body of one function, you don't want to recompile most of the file either. Right. So we, um, we took the stuff we knew about in C Sharp 88 for checksumming regions of the source file. Yeah. And we would compile the global part, the, the global declarations in the source file and then skip every unchanged function body. Yeah. We had to teach the back end of the compiler to keep a database as well of what it had from before. Yeah. And when that all boiled down, you could edit one body, one line of a function and we would skip all the other bodies. We would generate just a little bit of intermediate language. Yep. We would code gen just one uh, function, unless it was inlined, in which case we'd do the things around it that it inlined. And um, that sped up compiling by about a factor of two. But it turns out that wasn't worthwhile doing. It, in, in the big scheme of things, that factor of two was noise. And as, comp as the machines got faster, compiling one file became less of an issue. The other one we did, which was a team with Rico and Dan, yes. John Cage. But it was all this based on the same thing. It's all like, based on PDBs and do, We couldn't have done minimal rebuild without half, like all the checksumming stuff that was in done for ICC. We needed that oh, for yeah, minimal yeah, rebuild yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. Okay. So like we were already standing on the shoulders of ICC. And PDBs. And PDBs from before that. Yeah. yeah. And which is, you know, so, it's turtles all the so way down. So can you explain the idea of min, min rebuild? So min, min rebuild is... Um, you change, make a change in a header file, a fairly modest change, like you add a new uh, non-virtual method, which is exactly what happens if you add a new handler to, say, a button control in an MFC app. Right. Okay? So yeah, technically you just change the definition of the class and you change the .h file and the whole world includes that .h file. But, um, and so if you did a normal build, you'd say, oh, I have to recompile those guys. However, the particular change that you made, no one actually cares about, okay? Because we know no one is calling that function in any of the other files because you just added it, right? And you and you added the definition in the one file. There's some CPP file that you put the definition in. So clearly we have to compile that. So 
but that's actually all we have to compile. If we if we um, notice that uh, no one else was using that method because it's brand new, once we've compiled the file that contains it, we're done. Um, and typically, the only references to it are in that very same file. So all these other guys, we can just say, eh, never mind. You don't have to compile that guy. That sounds really easy, Rico. Yes, yeah, so it's really easy. But remember everything I just told you about? You, know, you have to tweak all the line numbers and stuff. Yeah, yeah. there, there, it's, it's, that rears its ugly head again. So you added a new line to the .h file. Now all the debugger stuff is is perturbed. So um, so you have to fix all that. All the browser stuff is perturbed. So when you skip, you have to do a little bit of work. You have to like, okay, well, just let me record like, you know, what should happen to the line numbers and whatever else. And we had this slick way of figuring out what was different. Because yes. as you were saying, we never delete types from the type file, right? That's correct. So when you created the new version of the class that created a new type, which we could compare to the old type. Because so we, had, we had that information as well. We it's still there. Oh, someone added a field to point x. Right. So we could look and see what did they do to the type. And we knew the debugger information was authoritative. So, um, so we figure out then if, what they did to the type. And then depending on what you did, we, we knew which files um, needed to be recompiled because... Uh, this then, is the trick. Yeah, this is the trick. So <laughs> if you remember everything yeah, about yeah. who depends on what, it's too expensive. Right. There's so many program databases of history had about a thousand bytes of code for every line of source because right. they kept all these elaborate data structures. Kind of like ours. Yeah, yeah. And so the question was, <laughs> and how, from C -sharp how can we have an incredibly cheap way of remembering that I depend on the size of point of struct point, yeah. or I depend on the virtual function uh, Some virtual index function. of this of this thing. And what we eventually got to is saying each of those facts will just turn into an integer. And a fact derived on a fact will we'll always make it that that's a repeatable function. So we can, if, if I depend on the size of this thing, it's that generated an integer like 14. And if Rico, in another source file, compiles that, it'll still be 14. Yep. And so then we wanted to have a, a way of describing all the things I depend upon, which was just a set of bits. And we had this clever idea that we can fold the set of bits and use a probabilistic test, which says, it's, it's you know, is 14 in the set? Yep. And we can either say, no, it's definitely not in the set, or maybe it's in the set by folding this large thing. Yeah. In doing so, we invented bloom filters. We yeah. didn't know we didn't that they were called bloom, bloom filters, filter, but that's what we did. Yeah. And so building a bloom filter for what I depend on in the header, and yep. building another bloom filter for what changed in the header, yep. you can you then just do, just, just do a very simple yep. intersection, of bit and, yep. of these two thousand bit vectors. And you, and 98 you know what? good. The intersection is zero. Yep. I don't have to, I, there's no way that I depended on something that changed. Skip it. Skip this, uh, skip this file. So the, the net is that the dependency information becomes tiny. We used 256 bits per class that's used in the comp land. There were typically five or six classes, I don't know, or 10 classes. So hurt me, there's like, you know, a thousand bits of dependency information total for any given comp land. And you could very quickly say, yes, yes, no, 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 and you're done. And it's possible that you would say yes to something that didn't really because yeah. You know, he depended on something else that hashes to 14. Yes. I don't know what it is, but oh well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We're going to recompile that guy. It's a benign it's, false yeah. positive. It's a benign false positive. So it was 98% good. We had a 2% false positive rate with the with the metrics we picked. We just picked bit field, bit, bit set sizes that, that we were pretty good. Yeah. yeah, not too big, big good enough, not to get too many false positives. So the net of it was you could use class wizard, you could add a new method which typically would have made you recompile your entire world, and instead we'd recompile exactly the file that you needed to be recompiled and skip all the others. Ooh, it was yes. a thing of beauty. And even that didn't make the product fast enough. That got the builds way down. It did help. But finally, there was not, no excuse for the traditional performance engineering stuff, of working set analysis, well, and pro profiling. And oh my goodness. I remember Rico had pages and pages and pages of... I still were, have they, a were they VA dumps? Or yeah, what? I still have a notebook of... At, at, well, VA dumps, but also I have this thing where we flush the working set every second and then set oh, a yeah. bit for everything that was touched in the next second, and then I could watch the traces. It was like ticker tape. Yeah. You know, like what pages did we touch? Why did that come in? <laughs> it's like, what are you doing? 
You can't help. You can't load that code. We're compiling. Don't you understand? No, because the killer was the machines didn't have that much memory, yeah. and so you had the How IDE. How much memory? That sixteen megs. That no. was like a big machine. That no. was like our sixteen. Our, no, dude. But we, our target. What was our target? Than was that. it four? Yeah. I can't remember. Like four meg. With that's eight. with the IDE loaded yeah. and right. the compiler running. Yeah. It, in our dreams, 16 meg. Yeah, oh, that's right. That was yeah, a big machine. In our dreams, uh, we were up to four. So you can still imagine the data, the database for from C sharp 88. It's now 1992. Uh, it's about four. 1994. No, no, it's past that. 95. 90. Uh, 95 was Dolphin. So it's like. This is 94. No, no, no. 95. I'm sorry. 90. Right. 95 is Olympus. 95 is Olympus. Sorry. So that and that's that's BC4. So it, yeah. it, you're so you're right. It's about 1994. So. Two meg machines are fairly common, and developers frequently have four meg machines. And then, depending on whether you're running on NT or Chicago, right. you may or may not get all. Anyway. But the point is, the compiler wants all the memory to do its job, and it's important to get the heck out of the compiler's way because if you're hogging up memory, then it doesn't have enough memory to do its job and to cache the PCH and whatever else. So the IDE has to like squeeze itself into a tiny little thing yes. while a compile is going, so that the compiler doesn't. Get hosed, right? Yeah, yeah. So we watched every little thing, and when we were finished tuning Olympus, it used nobody believes this when I tell them, but yeah, I have yeah. the traces. Yeah. Thirteen pages. Oh, oh the, the IDE 13, got it. The yeah, IDE yeah, yeah, yeah. thirteen pages. Yes. So that's thirteen 50, times four K. Fifty K or something. Yeah. Less than sixty four K, right? Yeah. Sixty four K would be sixty. Yeah. Thirteen pages of the whole thing. We even had to turn the carrot off because it's funny. <laughs> I've been watching the traces and I'm like, every second it, there's this. All these DLLs get touched every what the heck? And I'm looking at the screen and I'm like blink, blink. And I'm like, it's the carrot. Yeah. You know, the carrot's now pulling in more than everything else put together. They're like, I'm turning that bad boy off. I don't need I don't need a flashing carrot during the build. So, um, but that's what you did. Um, the culmination of all this though is like was it ten seconds for a small edit on yeah. the four eighty six something machine yeah. of the day? Yeah. Which was huge compared to yeah. five minutes oh, at yeah. the start of the Yeah. Start of the yeah, day. we were down we were down right around ten seconds on the on on a good box. Yeah. Um, I remember the 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 D flat scenario I think it was called. Yeah. I started I remember like the name, I can't remember. Forty five seconds. Flat? D flat, yeah. Okay. That was the 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 name of the of the test case. I, I don't even okay. know what it did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't. Uh, I didn't even run it. No, we would never, we run, never it. ran it. We just, just, build we're just build building build. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea what it did. I don't know, I just did that. Maybe something musical. I have no idea. Um, so we just built the thing, and um, and we'd be clocking. Well, how much memory to use? How much size? How big of that stuff? Um, and where's the time going? And what's the spread? So um, so yeah. Uh, by the time we were done, the the PDBs were sharing a bunch of stuff, and and then they had more stuff they had to do later because and the, continue and that stuff well, was yeah. post us post us, um, and also post us is making PDBs multi-threaded. Poor Dan. Yeah. Um, because we, they wanted people to run multiple compiles at the same time. The problem with having a central database um, is that you lock the file right when while it's being updated. It was and, a two-phase commit thing, yeah. so it only wanted to have, it's like a write lock, one, yep. one writer at a time. Yep. That's so he made a server and he would like send the types over and so any number of compiles could be happening at the same time and yeah. the, all the types would be transparently unified and that would uh, tank perf and... Dan Spalding. Uh, Dan Spalding. Dan Spalding. Man. Yeah, Dan, and Dan was substantially responsible for, I talk about minimal rebuild like I wrote all the code. It is too loud, right? Dan wrote most of what I'm talking about. Yes. I was doing all the line number fix-ups for a browser oh, stuff yeah. and whatever else, yeah. um, you know, and driving requirements and whatever else. Dan wrote all the uh, the compiler driver stuff that we're talking about. Dan wrote all that. So where's Dan these days? Uh, yeah, I, don't, I know where he's he'll coming, be tomorrow. He's coming to dinner uh, <laughs> well, tomorrow. He's coming to dinner so tomorrow, let's let's say that, so that's our how we made the compiler faster yeah. uh, story. Well, yeah. faster. So tomorrow we're having a reunion dinner. Uh, for about 80 people. Cool. Um, and actually, Facebook is a good way to find friends of friends that we haven't talked to in 15 Some, years. Somebody's know? bound to know somebody who knows somebody. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know how people did this before. The power of the we just kind of seeded it with, we had a couple of team photos, and we said, uh, I think these are those people, and then that kind of, yeah. kind of expanded. It helps, it, it, sure, it helps to have some, some people on the team that are very, very networked. Uh, yeah. So clearly we had a few hubs. Um, and uh, but then, you know, you get your tendrils, and then it's just a ton of work. So let's. Yeah. These guys have been working on this for weeks. 
let's now zoom to where we are today. Yes. Because that was then, yes. and now we're now. Yes. Uh, I don't know any. 13 pages. No, sorry. That's no, 13 pages. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know. It's more than 13 pages now. Slightly more than 13 pages. Yeah. Right. But you guys, that you're talking about sort of the, I could see like sort of the kernel of the evolution of what would become what we have today, sure. which, is this, which is basically a series of compilers that you get when you type, the compiler's yeah. running, you get IntelliSense, there's a database, there's yeah. concurrent transactions. Yes, yes, yes. But, you know, that's rock and roll, you guys started that, but I wanted to get your sense of what are you doing today, Jan? What's up, what are you, what's your story? I work on, I'm, I'm interested in building hardware. So, the last few years at Microsoft, I, I came back to Microsoft in the 2000s, and the last okay. few years I worked on parallel computing and getting the world ready for multi-core and mini-core. Uh, and I helped, Easy stuff. Helped Simple do the problems. parallel computing yeah. platform stuff that we shipped in VS. Rock and roll, man. Lots of good stuff there. Yeah. Um, but I love computer architecture, and I build uh, multiprocessors with FPGAs, field programmable gate arrays. Nice. And, um, uh, Jan's, that's my hobby. Jan's modest. He's like a world authority on. No, well, anyway, anyway, it's 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 really interesting. Uh, There's stuff no you one get alive to... who knows more about using <laughs> FPGAs uh, as general purpose microprocessors. You, you know, I, and I, you haven't written a book yet, have you? But no. you probably should. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'd say he wrote the book, but he just hasn't written it yet. <laughs> yeah. We'll get on that, man. Yeah. Well, that's yes. good to know. Uh, and that's uh, what I'm up to. What are you up to, Rico? Uh, since. 18 months ago, I've been working on Internet Explorer, and uh, there's nothing hard in Internet Explorer. No, <laughs> no problems there. Everything, you know, so Internet Explorer has been very challenging, very different, um, and interestingly, a huge development community, web platform, JavaScript, managed code. You think some skill transfer there? Because yeah, yeah. um, all the importance of JavaScript and the DOM model and and JavaScript interop. I, sometimes I I feel like. It's it's deja vu all over again. The, yeah. Like all the things we did with Com Interopt in in in, uh, in the CLR, and it's like all those same kinds of things come up again in, in JavaScript. And uh, sometimes you use very similar techniques to solve them. Sometimes differently. You know, obviously they have a garbage collection solution, and they have garbage collector problems. Their garbage collectors tune differently than the .NET one was. They have different kinds of workloads. Man, but um, I just you know I just feel like there's so much um, synergy there. So. Uh, it was, so it was very helpful bringing that context to IE, and um, uh, and I'm back to coding in C++, in C++ every day. So excellent. Yeah. How do you like that? Well, some days more than others. <laughs> um, some days more than others. Um, but you know, I'm an old hand at C++, so I, I, I'm probably better equipped to jump into the IE code base than a lot of new hires. Yes. Um, now that's so. like written in the. You know, because we last year you mentioned going native. Yes. And going native was something that was designed to um, herald in the C renaissance. Yes. And it was a C renaissance because, in some sense, Microsoft only talked about .NET mm -hmm. for 10 years. Yes. That is it. Yes. In fact, we tried to shove .NET into the kernel of an operating system, which the researchers pulled off, right? The singularity. Sure. Sure. Certainly not going to happen with Windows. So we wanted to kind of just get put C++ back in the spotlight, and it turns out a lot of good things actually have happened. When you think about the code bases you're used to, the IE code base, for example, is probably a C++ 98-ish, I would imagine, earlier-ish, kind of. You mean in terms of like terms the of libraries language. it uses? Yeah, yeah in terms of the constructs you're using. So, um, well, I probably shouldn't go into a lot of details, but the but. You'd find the language usage is actually quite modern. Really? Yeah, I think what you discover is that um, you have to be careful about what runtime dependencies you take because you have to run in many different contexts and you want to stay very light. So, so, um, so language constructs are quite modern, but uh, libraries are sort of let's you know stick with the basics um, and build exactly what we need on top of that rather than depending on, on say standard libraries for this or that. But you know, it's it's uh, the kind of code you would write if you were trying to write, you know, a, something that needs to run in many different sorts of contexts. And so what you're saying really is that you don't use exceptions. 
Right. Uh, what I'm saying. <laughs> so I'm playing with you. I'm sorry. Maybe not so much in. STL or. Um, uh, you know, whatever. Right? I but wanted to play. Yeah, yeah, I don't want to go there. Yeah. Uh, All right, we won't go there. That's yeah, fun it's though. It's it made you blush, so that's a good. No, no, that's not. That's really easy to do. That's, <laughs> you don't get a cookie for that. Right on. Yeah. Well, hey, man, this is great that you guys put this on. It definitely is something to celebrate. Thank you. Well, and, it's uh, uh, it's been it, it's been a great pro. I mean, how many software products? have had a continuous development life of 30 years, because C- before C- Visual C++ it was 10 years of Microsoft yeah. C. Yeah. There's always been people working on that product line, right? And how many of them have had yeah. a continuous impact, and I mean, still essential tool, it's still relevant to uh, yep. to to the marketplace. It's not and, that many. And uh, they're out there, but there's not that yeah. many. Yeah. So it's, I'm, I'm grateful to have had a chance to work on something like that in my career. It's a great thing to do early in, in a person's career too. Yes. Was, uh, well, I've, I've worked on a number of internal products, and they didn't ship. Yeah. And I said, I got to work on something that's doomed to ship, that's guaranteed to that's ship. That's right. No like, matter like what that. happens, Microsoft has to I ship. Had, this I had a conversation with, with Manny yeah. one day, Manny Vellum. On this stuff, it? and I said, Manny, could I just work on the linker? I mean, like the linker's good. We got a link, right? I'll just work on the linker. It'll be fun. Yeah. And um, and uh, who knows? I actually ended up. I thought I was joking. Yes. But, yeah, oh, did you, you end up working? I ended up working, working on the linker. Yes. So uh, so there you go. Excellent. All right. Well, hey, thank you for your time. We'll be talking to you guys. All right. Thanks for using this our product. Right Thanks on. for using VC over the years. Yeah, for sure. All right. Wow, man, that was cool. I see. Yeah. C sharp eighty eight. Hmm, that incredible. Yes. Hey, man, Jan Gray and Rico love those guys. They're yes. so humble. They're so nice. Yeah, yeah, that's great. You know, and, really and, cool and, stuff. You know, I like the fact that you know C is always you know down to the meta, mm-hmm. always performant. Yep. You know, we but they had to do a lot of work thing. on performance, as we learned yep. in that conversation. It's always like hard, it man. never comes for free. It never comes free. Still now. Still now, <laughs> man. But you guys yeah. are rocking and rolling. Like, Compilation speeds yes. um, can be an interesting thing, and we mm-hmm. talked about that, of course, back mm-hmm. in the early days. It could be really long, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you know, it's tremendous it's ideas of how the, what those guys did with the database and stuff yeah. like that. And so, yes, yes, you guys are still cranking today. Now, basically, you guys are like a, a, a garden of compilers. Yes. Right? You have all the front end compiler yeah, stuff, yeah, yeah, the yeah. database, the back end, yeah, blah, yeah, yeah, blah blah. Yeah. It's amazing that you guys. You know how you've evolved from one we point to where you are things. today. Yes, we do a lot of things, but you know, mm-hmm. we always try to get better. Maybe you know, one less compiler would would not be a bad idea. <laughs> yeah. On that note, rock and roll, brother. <laughs>